rejoice and be glad in it. Wesley Chapel, good morning. Good to have you here on our fifth Sunday of the Easter season. I, I think that Andy did a great job of getting us in the mood to worship. And uh, most of you didn't get the chance to see this, but maybe at the end of the service, Butch will be more than happy to show off some of the dance moves he had during that opening song. That's what the Spirit does, brothers and sisters. It just gets into you, and you just got to let it happen. So glad to have you here at worship. And um, also, I have some very exciting news to share with you during announcements today. Uh, the next portion of the bishop's plans for re-entry was introduced to the pastors on Monday night. And starting today, we can sing in church. Amen. So I knew you'd be excited about that. I know that's something we've been waiting to do. So uh, really, if, if it hits you today and you know the words, go ahead and start singing. Ain't nobody going to say anything. <laughs> Good to have you guys here and this exciting news as we are looking now into this post-COVID world. And, and we'll see some other changes coming this summer as things begin to open up. And certainly one of those things that is happening is our upcoming Bible study that starts uh, this week. We'll have the normal class we meet uh, starting on Tuesday at 10 a.m. here in the Family Life Center. For those of you who are working during the day and can't necessarily make the morning meeting, on Monday evenings, we will also have a class here at 7 o'clock. So uh, Lisa Scheich and Christy Evans will be leading the Monday night class. Uh, if you are interested in being a part of that, just let Carla or myself know. We will have books waiting for you tomorrow night. And always, those who are going to join us on Tuesday, your books will be there as well. So do make note of that as we get our Bible study back up and going. And as I debuted last week, the, the next two books that we're going to be looking at over the course of the summer and into the fall, we're going to look at Fear of the Other by Will Lillabon, and a book that I'm reading now that I'm really excited to do with you, which is Looking for God in Messy Places. How to find hope, how to practice hope, and how to grow in hope. So these are some exciting things you can look forward to coming this summer as well. Uh, Tom and Ann Bardot wanted me to announce to you that uh, from 2 to 4 today at uh, 201 43 Oak River Court, they're going to be trying to get rid of the stuff that did not uh, was not sold in the estate sale. Anything else, Tom and Ann, that I need to say about it? Come and get it. Bring your trucks, bring your trailers, and help them clear out that house. Uh, two to four today, if you can. No charge. No charge. Everything's gone. I'll see you at two o'clock then. Perfect. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, it is a beautiful day outside. It is an exciting and spirit-filled day in here. So let us prepare ourselves now for morning worship.
and sisters, if you will join me in our opening sentences this morning, these are excerpts from Psalm 22. Thank you, Jay. Brothers and sisters, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. Each generation shall tell of the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. Surely the Lord has done. Brothers and sisters, as we enter into this time of prayer, I do have a couple of extra prayers I want you to be aware of as we enter into this time. Uh, prayers over the Burke family uh, that was um, joined together in holy matrimony in our sanctuary yesterday, so blessings for their new marriage. Also for one of our youth, uh, Abby Evans, who had knee surgery this past week and has uh, had a lot of pain from that. We ask you to remember her in your prayers. And also Shauna Robertson and Dalton Parrish. Let's now go to God and lift up the prayers of our people. Friend of Ginger Lanning, Ann Johnson, Aubrey and Betty Blanks, Barrett Madeline White. Lord, we are part of the body of Christ. It is you who guides us, sustains us, strengthens and keeps us. And Lord, we know that it is right and good to come before you and open our hearts and offer these names before you. Lord, we know that your hand is working in and through all of those lives, those that we've named and those we've kept in the deep recesses of our heart. We trust your plan. We actively seek it out. Lord, as you begin to comfort and provide solace, Keep those names. Keep us as your people. As we offer these to you at your altar, we say together the prayer that your Son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, I had a, an exciting children's message planned today, but we don't have any kids here. And I don't think it would be right if I necessarily, you know, called out Megan Hall and, and made her be the, the face of our children's message today. So Megan, I'm not going to do that. But this is what I'm going to share with all of you guys. That what I was going to tell the kids today was that we talked about the body of Christ last week. And how we are all part of that. And we all have different roles to play. And I shared with them that it's exciting that we all get to have a say in, in what the body of Christ is supposed to be. One of the most exciting things is, is when we have people who come from outside of our church that come and worship with us, and then they find out, you know, I want to be a part of what's happening here. This is a family, this is the body of Christ I want to join, and I want to bring my unique understanding of God to them, but I also want to learn from them. And then find out together what it is that God is going to do with all of us. And this is just one of those Sundays that we get to celebrate when people who have come and worshipped with us and have said, You know what? I want to be a member of this church. We have a family in the back here. Uh, Danny and Nell, I'm going to invite you guys to stand where you're at. And... Brothers and sisters, if you will, I will direct your eyes to our PowerPoint. We have a couple of questions that we want to ask them as they officially join as members of Wesley Chapel United Methodist Church. So Danny and Nell, since y'all are already members of the United Methodist Conference, we're going to invite you guys in as you transfer from Matoka into Wesley Chapel. So as members of this congregation, Wesley Chapel United Methodist, will you faithfully participate in our ministries with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. If so, answer, I will. Amen. Members of the household of God, I commend Nell and Danny to your love and care. I ask that you do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by your prayers, our presence, our gifts, and our service, that in everything God may be glorified in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, the God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Danny and Nell officially, finally, welcome to Wesley Chapel United. especially those who served in the church. I want you to know that Danny and Nell were one of the first people to stand up. So I'll remember that come nominations in October and we'll get a phone call. It's a beautiful thing. Thank you all so much. Brothers and sisters, before we enter into our sermon time, I'm going to ask that you bow your heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to your message today. A message about patience and growth. And Lord, as we prepare ourselves for this message, we ask your blessing upon those gifts that we have offered back to you. Lord, we seek a transformational experience in every facet of our lives. As we offer a portion of the gift that you've given us back to you. May we be witnesses to what you've done in our lives, in the lives of our church, and in the lives of others. Lord, this is the prayer we offer you in heavenly name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. 
So last week, we looked at 1 John chapter 3, and, and we kind of reviewed where we've been as a body of Christ over the past four or five weeks, and I think we admitted that we've had some really exciting times, we've had some very painful times. But one of the beautiful things that we realized about our church here is that it truly is one body in Christ where we realize that we are all children of God. And when we talked about everything last week, I asked you the question, were you satisfied with where we are at? Because in the passage, the writer of 1 John 3 tells us that what we will be has not yet been revealed. That is coming in time. So the challenge for us was to be happy with where God has taken us, but to realize that God has more in store. God needs us to continue being a community of faith. God needs us to continue to witness about what God has done here outside these walls and to be ready for God's change that is coming. And this morning we're going to hear a little bit more about that, about the importance of community and about growth and about patience. We're actually going to go back in time to the Last Supper. We're going to look at John chapter 15, the first eight verses. If you have your Bible with you, I encourage you to turn with me or to follow along on the PowerPoint. This is a passage that will be very familiar to all of you. It's where Jesus is, he is the true mind. Let us hear now the word of God. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, for prune, uh, he prunes to make it bear more. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as a branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And when my Father is glorified by this, you will bear much fruit, and you will become my disciples. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus has some important information for us in John chapter 15. It's about realizing that we have to stay connected to the true vine. And we also have to abide in him just as Jesus has promised to abide in us. Now John chapter 15 verses 1 through 8 is a standalone passage. But I think it's very important for us to understand what happened right before this. So that it will help us understand why the disciples missed the important message that Jesus had for them in John chapter 15. So as always, homework for this week. I want you to go home and read John chapter 13, 14, and 15. Scholars will tell you that this is known as Jesus' farewell discourse. Where over the course of two and a half to three hours... Jesus is sharing the last bits of information with his disciples at the Last Supper. And if you go back and you read it, you will realize that Jesus is cramming in a lot of information for people that are already dealing with sensory overload at that table. Jesus has a lot to tell. And when you go back and you read those passages, you realize how they could miss some of Jesus' nuanced language. In John chapter 15. This is some of the things, as, as we know, that they have already heard by the time we get to John 15. Jesus has already told them 
I'm not going to be here long. I'm going to a place you cannot go. So the disciples are already sitting at this table, worried about what exactly Jesus is talking about. Where are you going? Why can't I be there? What's going to happen to me? So they're already nervous. The second thing is Judas has already gotten up from the table and has just left. This is the person who had been with them at the start of Jesus' ministry. So they don't understand why he's gone. So not only are they concerned, but they have questions. And then in the passage right before this, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, I'm going to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's going to strengthen you. It's going to guide you. It's going to send you out to preach the good news to everyone you meet. So they're already keyed up and ready to go and say, wow, we're going to get this heavenly power that's going to allow us to do amazing things. So sensory overload. They're worried, they're concerned, and they're excited. And then Jesus tells them to do two things. Stay connected to me and abide in me. Essentially what Jesus is asking them to do is, sometimes the best thing you can do for me is to simply sit and be in my presence. Patience. Patience. That's what Jesus asks. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. Jesus promises us this in this passage, that if we connect to this vine as Jesus, and we realize that we are one of the branches, a couple of things are going to happen. We're going to bear fruit. Jesus tells us that if we connect to the true vine, which is in the care of God, we will produce for God. Every single person is going to do that. Jesus also tells us something else, that when you hook into the true vine, God, as the vine grower, is going to prune you. That means God's going to find the parts of you that are not exactly as of God and is going to smooth them out. Go take that brush and scrub really hard until you shine as God intends you to shine. So you're going to produce fruit. God's going to smooth away what's not of God. And then the third thing is, not only are you going to produce fruit, but God's going to cut you back so you can produce fruit longer. Jesus doesn't intend for you to be a vessel of God to then be thrown away. God wants you to last the entire time. God doesn't have a retirement date set for you of 65 where you can say, well, I'm going to kick back and play golf all day, not like my dad. God intends to use us as a vessel for God every day of our lives. And why is Jesus telling the disciples that? This important piece of information on the last night, in the last few hours he has to tell them this. Why do they need to know they need to stay connected? Because immediately after this, brothers and sisters, they're going to get up and go to Gethsemane where wheels will be put in motion that they are not going to be able to stop. They're going to watch their Lord and Savior be arrested, tried, and die on the cross. All of a sudden, because they believed in Jesus, they are going to be hunted and persecuted. In the space of 12 to 24 hours, they're going to feel like Jesus is dead and gone and it's all over. They're going to ask questions about, was this real? And when Jesus says, I want you to stay connected to the true vine, he's saying, abide in me because what's coming is going to challenge your faith. But I don't want you to forget who's there. If you connect with me and I'm connected to God, you will not be forsaken. Jesus is trying to warn them that what's coming 
I don't want you to face alone. How about that? A God who can see things coming over the horizon and says, hey, I want to be with you through that. A God that's simply asking us to abide in Him. Not just obey the Ten Commandments, as important as they are. Not just to do it because we're told Christians are supposed to do good things. We are to abide in God because God wants to offer us a place where we are kept whole, safe, protected, strengthened, matured, grown, and then let out. That sounds like a great deal to me. A God who looks at each and every one of us and says, I can make use of you. So what would it look like? What would be a human example of the true mind where we can look and say, well, there's clearly branches that have borne fruit? I was lucky to be a witness to an example of that in this Family Life Center on Tuesday night. As some of you who gather here today, Colton, one of our youth, became an Eagle Scout. And as I was sitting in the chair and I was watching the ceremony, I looked around at the people that were here. I saw scouts that he had been with for the past decade. Mentors, including his father, who had gone on all these trips across the country with them to teach them the things they needed for their badges. And I would say that these mentors were more than just scout leaders. These were life mentors, life coaches that were helping grow this young man. There were members of this church who probably didn't know Colton that well, but they came to support him because of this accomplishment. I saw fellow members of his youth group who came just to support him. And the best part is, we all were witness to what the vine had done. All of those people that helped Colton get to that point had at some point connected into a greater vine that promised to guide them to be vessels to serve when the opportunity arose. And what kind of fruit was born over the course of 10 years of scouts? 10 plus? A young man who stood up here became an Eagle Scout, and he shared a story of a time when they were at a lake and a boat, I think, was capsized in the middle of the lake. And Colton saw this, and another scout was with him, and they tried to get the attention of a lifeboat, and they couldn't. But rather than wait and watch this tragedy get worse, they swam out into the lake to help the people in the boat. And he said the reason he did that was because, and I quote, I was trained as a scout to respond and not wait for others because that's what you're supposed to do. Colton worked hard. But he didn't get there on his own. It's because people were willing to serve, support, and help grow them. Because at some point, others were placed in their lives to help grow them. A young man taking the first steps into adulthood because of the vine he felt in this church. But that growth doesn't come overnight, does it? It takes time. It takes that P word, patience. I hate patience. I'll just, I'll just name it for what it is. It's a challenge. When Jesus says, abide in me, as I am you, Jesus is saying, I'm covenanting with you to stay the course. I hope you'll do the same in return. Now I've shared with you all parts of my story that led me into ministry. And you'll remember that there's things I wanted to do in my life that involved the church, but at no point did it ever involve being a pastor. And so I chased what I thought was my dream, and it didn't quite work out. 
And did I stop at that moment and say, okay, God, you need to take over. I need to be patient. I need to trust you. Absolutely not. I did two or three other things. Failed miserably. And it wasn't until I was flat on my face and I found myself praying and I said, okay, God, maybe what I need to do is to step out of the way and allow you to lead and grow me into who you want me to be. You know what happened when I made that prayer? Nothing. Nothing. And for weeks, what seemed like months, I waited for God's answer. So I understand when the gospel writer says, well, what's going to happen if we're not producing fruit? Are we going to wither and die and be tossed into the fire and burn? Is that what Jesus is saying? Connect or else? What God was doing in what seemed like that elongated time of waiting, God was preparing me and growing me so that I could say yes when it came. When Jesus shares those words, those branches are going to wither away and be burned. Jesus is saying, I want you to connect with me because when you connect with me, I'm going to grow you and it's all going to fall into part of God's plan for you. If you connect to anything else, the world's going to suck it out of you, going to use it you up, and then it's going to toss you to the side, and then you're just going to be disposable. Cast your cell by date. God is growing us. God is maturing us. But what we need to do is to offer patience in return. Now, we very well may connect, and we may get the answer from God right then and right there, and that's a beautiful thing. But it's God's time. It's not ours. And that's scary. And that's frightening. And it doesn't fall into how we want things to go. But God has never done things how humans expected it to be. But Jesus' message for you today, brothers and sisters, is I can use you. Just have patience as I prepare it. I think it's very powerful that as we hear this passage from John 15 today that took place at the Last Supper, that as we hear these words of stay connected and abide in me as I abide in you, this offers us a chance of rededication, of stepping out of our wants, our needs, our opinions, our thoughts, our biases, our partisan sides. And Jesus invites us back to the foundation. That we are loved, that we are precious, and God offers something new, something wholesome, something real. And it happens at the table. Whereas Jesus convened with his closest friends, including one who is about to betray him, and he said, this bread that I break for you and this cup that I offer to you is for you. Perhaps on a morning such as this, we can rededicate our lives and our patience to God's guidance. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. At times we have failed to be an obedient church. We haven't done your will. We have broken your law. We've rebelled and run away from your love. 
and we've not shared the love you had for us with our neighbors. And in the pursuit of what we want and what we need and what we wish to collect, we often ignore the cry of needy. So Lord, forgive us. Free us that we may be obedient and wait patiently for your will. As we gather here today, Lord, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on all the people that are gathered here and on the gifts of bread and of cup, of wafer and of juice. We ask that you make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that for the world we may be the body of Christ that is redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as you begin to open up your wafer, hear these words. Christ took bread. He blessed it, broke it, and he offered it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Do this. To remember to me. Then Jesus took the cup, he lifted it up, he blessed it, he offered it to them and said, drink from this, all of you. This is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you may drink it in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, we look to you, the one who offers a clean slate at this table. We often prefer to run away and to complain when you don't fall into our timeline of when things need to be met and done. But yet, Lord, you've never broken your covenant with us. So as we've come to your table, and we have, preferred, we have received your bread and your juice, your wafer and juice, we are reminded of your faithfulness, of your love, and the promise that we are part of your kingdom. This is the prayer we offer in most heavenly name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. They sat down for supper in their quiet little house. Look at one another, what was God doing now? Times were hard, and 
debts must be paid. Where was God? So little food on their plates. Then the daddy broke his silence, and the kids just listened in. He said, when I face the challenge and feel like giving in, I'll go back to my favorite memory. To be exact, it happened here in Galilee. When my mama woke me up and said that we were going up, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.